Hey everybody, welcome to my workshop in Axminster. Uh, we're down right in the southwest of the UK, but we're here supporting the wood turning stall. And um, today, this is your session really today, um, all I want to do is um, give you an, under, uh, an underlying um, idea of what the Axminster wood turning chucks, jaws and centers are all about. If you didn't know about them before, of course. If you've seen uh, any of my demos before, you'll understand uh, my background. I've been working here for Axminster Tools for uh, 26 years now, and I've seen a development of these chucks and centers um, sort of re rising really to the top of, uh, of the UK market. So we're really excited to be um, uh, supplying uh, Steve and, and supporting him in his endeavors to, to sell our chucks around the US as well. So really, really excited about that. There's a lot going on at the moment this weekend, of course. We've got the AEW going on um, in Kentucky. And I know uh, my friend and, and fellow uh, workshop um, uh, demonstrator here, Jason Breach, he's going to be there uh, also. So if you have any more questions about chucks and centers, don't forget to go and see him or Helen Bailey. Of course, she works in one of our um, uh, northern branches. So um, this is your session. I've already said this is your session. So if you have any questions on the Chuck Centers uh, and Jaws, please just just pop them in the chat. I've got Stephanie here. She's going to be doing the, the question asking. Um, and there's also Steve uh, back at HQ. He's going to be um, doing your questions uh, on the chat section as well. So just fire them in. We're used to having questions asked, so, so no problems here. Um, I'm looking to go over a few of the jaws. I wanted to look at a few of the centers and a few of the sort of quirky little things that you can do with some of these um, some of these uh, bits of uh, equipment. Um, just on the an outline, all of the the jaws and the chucks are stainless steel. Okay, so we're all of the chucks that you're going to see me demonstrate today. I've got stainless steel um, uh, throughout. So in terms of corrosion, it's really really good to stand up to humidity and um, and moisture. Um, from rain or any of those sorts of things so that's a great plus to start with um I, if anything like my workshop in the uk down here is quite a damp place and um they do if they're not um, being used for for great portions of time they do sort of develop that that rust if they've been used quite a lot of course then you got sort of like a patina and it's a mixture of your hand marks and uh and moisture that causes the problem but not with the stainless steel I've got two chucks here in focus at the moment. I've got uh, the 100, or what we call the SK100. Now, I do apologize. Uh, this is a metric uh, measurement that we're quoting here. So uh, 100 being it's cross its um, diameter. And then we've got the SK114, which is a slightly bigger version. Um, and now on this particular one, we've actually got the same jaws. So this is what we refer to as C jaws. Okay. Um, and right from our history back 20 odd, probably 30 years ago now, um, we um, titled the jaws A, B, C, D, and, and so on, and these happen to be the Cs. We might change that now because unless you know, you don't know what an A jaw will look like. So we're going to probably think about um, uh, calling them the name to represent the number, the diameter, for instance. So, um, so yeah, that's to come though. But let's have a look at the C jaws because I'm quite passionate about this C jaw family, or what I call the C jaw family. Um, and a C jaw for us in Axminster speak is a dovetail jaw on the outside, but on the inside it houses a little tooth. And that's quite um, quite an unusual um, thing. I know a lot of people haven't seen it in the wood turning world. The tooth is there for a reason. And some people say, well, why don't you have a dovetail on the inside also? That is coming. So our um, uh, dove, what we call an E jaw, will have a dovetail on the inside and on the outside, but with the same diameters. It's reused at the moment. We've been using it for like to say 25 years for several things. The external dovetail will hold and support all of our dovetail rings. So dovetail rings I use an awful lot. Sometimes in place of a, um, uh, a face plate, um, so, which is its other name, a face plate ring. Um, and sometimes um, to hold things like this. So I've got a sanding disc on this one, uh, which I can then just put on my chuck, expand those jaws into. Um, and it holds that dovetail really nicely. Um, but like I say, you can use it as a regular uh, faceplate if you wanted to as well. So it's, it's a nice way of working without having to remove the chuck. This is why I like it. Because let's just say, for example, this was a bowl blank. I can put that on my chuck and shape the outside of the bowl, creating a foot or recess. And then I can turn it straight over 
put it onto the chuck which is already mounted and just unscrew um, the faceplate ring and that uh, makes our life a lot easier so um, i quite like that as an example to use with the sea jaws um, i also combine let's just have a quick look here just get that one out of the way for a minute um, i combine my sea jaws if i just swap that over and that faceplate ring if i take the tool rest out pop that in i'll combine that with another really uh, interesting uh, gadget here so this is our um, tool post system the axe mr tool post system now that will of course hold regular tool posts that we make but also this little capture plate here so this is a carving plate really so you can do some carving in your in, on the banjo of your lathe but this is also a little sliding collar where you can set the depth to center now i haven't done it here at the moment but what the idea of that is is so i can pop that on dead center and bring that little platform up now and use it as a sanding table and i use that quite a lot for flat sanding um, so i've changed the lathe now into um, a sanding machine so it's a perfect little device for doing those things um, just on a faceplate ring a little bit of plywood a little bit of velcro hook and loop system my sanded tool post the carving plate and um, the little the little collar there so a lovely little way of working this is why i'm talking about this c jaw family there's a lot going on with it so that's one thing is that's the the face plate ring um if we look now at the screw chuck same sort of thing the screw chuck though will go on the inside so there we are you can see now that we have a little uh, little ridge a little recess okay so you can see the double um, double diameter that locks really neatly and securely into that little tooth on the inside there we are so really really secure there's no way that's coming out because it's actually uh, enveloped in that uh, inner part of that jaw so i really like that one that's uh, uh, that's a good little a good little use of that inner c let's say for instance you're making a bowl um, anybody new to wood turning you've got two choices when you're holding a bowl to start with you're either going to be using a face plate so the first method we looked at or you're going to be using a center hole um, which you're going to use the screw chuck on that simply screws in there once it's in the chuck so those are the two methods i tend to use the, the face plate uh, sorry the screw chuck more on the smaller pieces and here's a good example here let's say for instance we're making something like this so a, a candle so we're going to do a little bit of um boring up through the center of one of these in a moment but let's just say you're making one of those so we're going to start off with a base if i try and make that base and use a faceplate on this all i'm going to do is mark this area with my screws so i need a faceplate uh, sorry a screw chuck with a center hole that i can screw that on create my outside or underside with a recess that i can just flip it round onto my c jaw dovetail and then i can turn the inside out so it's a really a, quite a convenient way uh, for us to work i've made it myself to work anyway we're going to look at those i've got a few little bits and bobs when it comes when it comes to um, lamps and long hole boring and joining together and all those sorts of things that i want to go over one last thing in the seed your family this is uh, and again i'll demonstrate this in a moment um, is the eccentric spiraling chuck so there we are um, i've mounted quite a gnarly piece of timber up there it's, it's a little bit knotty and everything but we're going to do a quick demo on that one and again that one with its dovetail on the back locks conveniently into that uh, that outer dovetail on my sea jaw and in expan in expansion mode we we like to have it so where this expands onto the dovetail where it's at its perfect circle okay so that's where you'll see everything in line with each other here okay not uh, not any bigger all right so that's the c jaw family so uh, we're going to work with a few of those little um uh, little projects in a moment just to play but before we do let me just demonstrate again it's okay us talking wood turning for those people that have been turning for a long time or those that are oh it don't have to be a long time if you've been turning for a couple of years even you start to pick up the lingo and you start to understand things when it comes to wood turning because there is a lot of a lot of bump out there a lot of um you know sort of inner language as it were um and it's one thing when you're buying chucks or your very first chuck and i got really confused at the very beginning 
Um, first of all, if you're talking Axminster speak anyway, if you're looking at our chucks, then really, um, at the moment for this size of machine, there's two chucks that I'm looking at. It's the hundred or the or the one one four, um, and it's as simple as this: small smaller machines, smaller chucks, bigger machines, bigger chucks. Um, you can get bigger jaws fitting um, the 114 more conveniently. When I say that, if you look at this one here, we've got an overhead step. There we go. Let's bring them into shot. Um, so this one is a big set of dovetail jaws with a gripper on the inside. I've got my C jaws on here. But if I wanted to, say, hold pen blanks or miniatures, let's just get a set of smaller jaws. Um, let's go with the... Oh, let's go with these small dovetails here. So this one, for instance, if I wanted to do that, I wanted a little bit less restriction, a little bit less things in my way, then the 100 chuck is a great little convenient chuck to, to be able to use. Uh, these jaws pinch into a smaller diameter right at the very top, and it also pushes you away from the chuck. So for getting around the back of bowls and things like that, and these are called the O'Donnell jaws, one of my favorite um, sets of jaws to use. Um, so there's that's the reason really that you would go from one chuck to the other. However, saying all of that, the 100 has now become one of my favourite chucks, and I'll probably use that over the 114 um, for one reason. It's a little bit more convenient in the hand, so I can pick it up easier. It's a little bit lighter. Um, but when I want to go to my bigger bits, then I'll go back to the 114. Do not get confused. Those two chucks are the same chuck. It's just that they have a different set of jaws on. Okay, that's the only difference there. And I'll show you an extreme difference. Um, let's go to this one. Still the same chuck. Okay, just with a different set of jaws on. Now I do, there we are. You can see the chuck there. And if you look at the back of that one, exactly the same chucks. Okay, the only difference is the jaws. So I've seen a lot of people get really confused about that they assume that the the different jaws means it must be a different chuck but it's not you can either buy one chuck and you can have lots of sets of jaws or you do what i do and have several chucks with several sets of jaws pre-mounted um, the other thing that i haven't mentioned yet is the jaws you've got two options they have what we call mounting jaws on the back now mounting jaws let's get a real big set of jaws here look that's a mounting jaw okay this bit with the teeth in and then there's a slider on that inside. Those mounting jaws can be bought as, a, as an extra. Now you can either keep one set of mounting jaws in the chuck and just undo the bolts, these two, and change your top jaw. Or you can keep your mounting jaws fitted to each of your jaws and just slide the old ones out and slide the new ones in. Okay, now the chucks are fitted with a little safety bolt in the back so you can't just do it without realizing. That is really, again, we're looking at people with the beginners out there or people that are just a little bit unsure as to how uh, far to undo a chuck. It will stop you from over um, expanding and jaws potentially flying out and pieces coming off a lathe. If you don't want to use that, you can undo that little bolt and it's in the back, access it, access it from the back, so you can easily undo and slide out an, uh, a, a jaw to change and put a new one in. Okay, so the all options, all all um, sort of bases are covered, as it were. So that's the the C jaws. We got any questions at the moment, or is uh, are they all being answered? We're a bit quiet on the questions at are the moment. Quiet? Yeah. Well, I can either I'll take that as a positive. Either I'm, I'm answering them before they get asked, or or there's no one there. You'll have uh, to you'll have to give them less information so they ask more questions. Yeah, no, exactly. Joking. Exactly. <laughs> right, what shall we start with? There's a few things I want to get. I definitely want to get with you today. So let's go. I'm going to start. I've been rabbiting on about the chucks for a fair bit. I want to look at a couple of centers. And I think what I'm going to do first is look at um, the multi-head. Oh, we got a question. Yeah, I'm going to go straight in with this one. Have we got any spigot jaws available? Have we got any spigot jaws available? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. I've got six um uh, chuck bays around me here so they are on a chuck somewhere yes can you see the spigot jaws i can see a set of i'm going to come right in the way now i'm going to get a set of other jaws there there we are there's a set of pen turning jaws which i call a set of spigot jaws i'm going to go and grab another set as well um they will be 
over here. Spigot jaws we use. I use spigot jaws for several things. I use them for holding small pieces. And uh, so let's say quarter inch stock. Um, I'll use them for holding drill bits if I want to drill really, really small. Um, I use them also for expanding to, into the inside of natural edge pieces. So if you take a piece of natural edge, and I'm sure um, a few of you will remember the days of pin jaws, or sorry, pin chucks. Um, and a pin chuck was a round piece of steel, a little bit like that one, uh, usually inch stock, and a, a portion of it was flattened off. You used a little pin on that flat, and when you drilled the um, uh, a hole down through what was going to be your natural edge, pushed that in and pulled it round, that pin locked in position. And then you use the tail stock to support, and that would drive your natural edge. But that pin chuck idea was developed, and now we've got these. It used to be, or the guy that developed them for us was a guy called uh, Phil Reardon, and he came up with the idea of that one. So now those pin jaws can be used to expand into that hole for natural edges, but I also use them, like I said, for holding drill bits and things like that. Yes, Steph? Yes, so that last question was from Robert. Uh, we've got another few. We've got one from Karen here. Is there maintenance we should do on chucks? Do you know, I've never, probably I don't feel right or wrong, but I've never opened uh, a chuck and um, needed to do any maintenance. They use a grease called graphite grease on these, so it's not your regular sort of chainsaw grease or anything like that. But the reason being that you you know, you put a, a grease like that, a liquid grease in, it would just fly all over the place the minute you start the lathe. Um, so no, I have never done any maintenance um, to them at all. The only thing I would say every now and again, um, it will be worth, especially if you're wet turning or using particularly gummy timbers, um, just put a brush, and I had a brush here somewhere, just run a brush up and down your slideways um, and the teeth as well. And just every now and again, glance down into the scroll of the chuck to make sure it's got no shavings down there. Because if you get shavings in and it graunches between the teeth, then obviously you're going to run into problems there. But it's not something I've experienced myself. Um, every time I pick the chuck up to put it on the lathe, I'll just wipe the back off to make sure there's nothing in there and then, then screw it up. Okay, so there's nothing interfering. Yes, Steph. Yeah, so we've got a question here from Stacey. She's asked, what chuck would you recommend for a midi lathe? The 100 that you've been showing or something smaller? I'd probably go for a smaller one. I'd probably go for something like the 80. Um, so the 80 millimetres, which works out to be about, uh, so 80 is about three inches, uh, about, about three and a quarter, I would have said. Um, so we go with something like that. Um, and that will work for the very small machines. We are, we will, we will be bringing out um, another chuck, which is going to is going to look very very similar to um, the eighty, um, with a few other sets of jaws. It's, it's all in the pipeline at the moment. We're looking to launch that around about Christmas time. That one won't be a stainless steel one, so that one will be a high speed steel. Um, that's going to be for the very very small lathe. So look out for that one. Yes. She says she's got a midi lathe, though. Midi, yeah. Midi. So tiny, tiny, tiny. Oh, is that a tiny one? I guess that, I guess, yes. So um, the, the reason that I say small chuck, small lathes, um, and this chuck pretty much, this lathe would pretty much take anything, but look at the belt within. So the motor power, pff, it doesn't really matter, the chuck, um, because you think most of the time you're going to put your, as big a bowl blank as you can get on your lathe. Um, it's more the belt size. So some of the really small lathes have quite small belts as well. And that's, it's that inertia. If we can cut down on as much weight as possible as you start the lathe up, more the better. Now, bearing in mind, you're going to have fairly big pieces of timber on there. If you can limit the size of the chuck, then, then fine. As soon as you go up to these sort of size machines and most bench top machines, if I'm honest, the belt size increases also. So you won't run into a problem with it. Yes, Steph. David's asked, um, would you, could you show how to change a jaw um, with the shelf attached? With the top, top jaw attached? Yep. Let's have a look. Let's go with this one. I think most of my chucks, I've taken out the, um, the inner bolt, the safety bolt, because, because I've been using it for ages and um, I find it a little bit more convenient to change. So where's the best view on this one? So yeah, I'm just going to check that I have. And if you haven't, the um, screw will be, yeah, I have. So the screw, the screw will be seen. It'll be visible inside. You can just make out. I get a pointy stick and point to it. 
Um, you can just make out the the corners of the jaws here. So that one there, that one there. So that's the very inner part of the jaw. You'll see that little grub screw. So that's out. So I can expand. Now, these are what we refer to as scroll chucks. So if all the chucks you know from wood turning, um, they will be, nowadays, they will be a scroll chuck. Back in the day, they weren't. We used to have collet chucks and things like that. But most of the wood turning chucks nowadays that I know of are scroll chucks. So if I take the jaws off, look. Okay. And I move the key again. You can see this little little gray section here. Okay. You can see that moving. Okay. That's actually a little spiral on the inside. And that's what locks into the teeth on the back of this jaw and moves them in and out along with the uh, the side uh, channel here that slots in that keeps everything in line also now look what we have we've got the chuck with markings on you may see that if i get the tilt in the right position there we are number one there look two three four now it's important that we get these in the right order because if you think about a spiral if you put a jaw in then you move that spiral around, it would catch the first jaw. If you move it around and uh, as you're doing that to catch the next jaw, first one's already moving in. So that means that the back of the jaws all have to be slightly different. Now, if I hold up jaw number one and jaw number four, you'll see that difference because that's where it is at its most extreme. So you can see the small gap at the front of number one and big gap at the number uh, four. And as you get to two, three, they get bigger as they get toward the number four. That's so they can catch up with the previous jaw. Okay, so really quite important. So for that reason, everything is numbered. The chuck's numbered, the top jaw's numbered, and the, the back of the mounting jaw is numbered. Now that is, it is important that you get that in the right order when you put your mounting jaw um, together. Okay, are we all good? Well, when you put your mounting jaw together, so number one needs to go on number one, and then once you've done that, number one goes into number one slot. Okay, so I'll put them back together again. So I've looked for the start of the slot. It's already grablet. There we are. We've got the scroll coming around. Back it off a little bit. Number two can go in. Advance the chuck key. Look for the start of the scroll. There it is. So back off a little bit. Every time I do this, and I think I've caught it, I just make sure that it's actually grabbed. Then back in again. Make sure it's grabbed. Number four. And then we wind in, and that's where they all mesh up together. There we are. So they all meet up nicely. Okay, so that was just a rough explanation of changing chucks on a jaw, on a chuck, on changing jaws on chuck. Yes, sir. Just want to apologise for that little change in light levels. Somebody <laughs> turned the lights off for us. So that was nice. There's a message in there somewhere. <laughs> um, I've got a question here from Carl. He's asked, he has a Clubman 100 chuck with a three-quarter inch... 16 thread three quarter 16 yeah yeah uh can that be changed to another thread size without buying a new chuck uh, i want to say yeah um unfortunately no um even though the back of that so have a look at this one this is this is um a clubman so even though this um is separate to that it is um it is a solid section so and these aren't available separately um at this moment at this stage unfortunately so it is a new chuck so the best advice now one thing i have found chucks do hold their price so if you if you're selling a lathe swapping a lathe then best thing to, i would sell the chuck separately first of all uh, unless you're struggling to sell the lathe um, but you can get good money back on them but no unfortunately they're not um, the same with the 114s um, and the new 100s actually because even though that's a capture plate on the back that is solid to this. It's all machined out of one piece. And there's a good reason we do it. It's just to stop any inaccuracies that might be there. 
Um, so we always try and make them solid. Any engineer will tell you that once you, if you get two surfaces together, you know, that's the, the, the chance for inaccuracies to creep in. And that's why we went that way. Um, so yeah, my apologies on that one. Right. Where am I? What are we going to do first? Let's turn, let's do some, l no, we said centers, didn't we first? Because I've been talking about chucks for long enough. So I'm going to look at a couple of centers now. Two of my favorite tail stop centers, actually. Um, and the first one is is this one. So this is our deluxe tail stock center. So this has got really heavy duty bearings in this one. And um, that means if you want to use it for your larger pieces, a little bit more pressure, absolutely what this one is made for. And I'm going to take it apart and show you why. Yes, Steph. Before you move too quickly on to centers, I do have one more question uh, about trucks and jaws. Yes. Um, so from Michael, he's asked, he understands that the SK114 and the SK100 have interchangeable jaws. Yeah. Do I need to denote 114 or 100 when buying additional jaws for my SK114? Um, he realizes that the SK80s are a whole different set. Yeah. SK80 is slightly different. So in the in the world of the 100 and 114, they are all interchangeable. However, there are there are jaws specifically designed uh, for the 114. The only reason they're spe specifically designed is we think about because the the first one that came was the 100. So the 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 extra size of the 114 gave us the opportunity to get even more accuracy and stability into the chuck because we had a longer um, or wider diameter that diameter that mean, meant that we could um, produce longer mounting jaws so longer the jaws longer the surface contact less likelihood of any movement so what we decided to do then is just have a small range of of jaws designed with this chuck in mind and one of them is the c jaw here so even though that c jaw could go on to here and vice versa we made that extra size to match the extra size of that chuck Mountain jaws on this chuck are slightly longer for the same reason. You could use them both, but if you use that one on here, you get overhang. And if you use this one on there, you get that. Okay, where they sit within the, um, the size of the chuck. Yeah, absolutely, you can use them, but that's that's the slight difference. There's, there's a couple of exceptions. I probably, once we start going to things like these big things here these are these are monster jaws these are and um then they do they just look a bit odd on the smaller ones so i would definitely go for the 114 when you're using the big the big jaws like that in fact i've got a chuck down here set up um with some colossus jaws okay so that's a 114 chuck okay and you can see even there protruding out the back a little bit okay so that on a 114 imagine putting that on on there even though they would fit um they would just be a, you know overhanging a little bit too much one okay. quick question not about chuckle jaws but how long roughly is today's broadcast long as i've set for about an hour but i haven't even done any turning yet so okay. yeah we're going to be about an hour guys <laughs> um there we are so let's pop those to one side. Let's just get a look at some of these centers. So look what we've got. This is my deluxe center. I love this center for several reasons. It's interchangeable. Um, it's stainless steel tips. Um, when I want to do some soft punky timbers or um, say wet timber, big hollow forms, I can take the, um, the cone off. Underneath that, we've got a ring center. It's actually got a three quarter 16 tread on it if that's used to anybody we used to do a three quarter 16 drill chuck which was brilliant because you could hold other things which i'm going to show you in a minute actually you could hold other things um to uh to let's say for instance you wanted to um, support a goblet when you were turning it that sort of thing so i'm going to show you another way of doing that as well but there we are that's that's really good if you wanted to change this tip though we have another um a couple of options on here we've got again another ring center I'm going to try and get really close to the camera for you and get it into focus. Nice little ring center, stainless steel. And remember the the late but great Del Niche 
This is one of his centers he developed. So this is for, again, just a way of, well, two things. For me, I can use, I can use this on really, really small pieces. It's a very, very fine tip. But it was a way of stopping splitting because that little piece sinks in. This is, again, on punky timbers. That little section um, actually drops into the timber and then the, the, um, the broader uh, taper stops it from splitting. So really good. They're just changed quite easily. Um, all I need to do on my thing, uh, just undo that little bolt that's inside. That's on a, a little Allen key. And then take that one out and put the other one in. So it's a really well thought out little center. It comes with its own uh, little wrench to um, enable us to swap over. Wrench and little Tommy bar to tighten things up. Really heavy duty bearings in that one. So if you're doing a lot of big work, that will definitely be the center to go with. Tips are all replaceable. Even though they're stainless, they're replaceable. Um, if you lose them in the shavings or if they get damaged in any way. So again, you know, it's just it's just a, a one of those centers that I have in the workshop that's that I wouldn't do without. I literally wouldn't do without it. It's so, so useful to me. But the other one that I'm going to just demonstrate a little project with um, is my multi-head. So that's the multi-head. If I undo that collar again to expose a three-quarter sixteen thread, okay, put that collar back on. That is actually, that collar is only there um, to release the centers. Now, the the center itself comes with these three. Okay, so re again, really useful centers. You've got a standard, standard center, which converts that into a normal, what we would all uh, recognize and the center there and these are just a very fine taper it's about five degree taper if that um, ring center okay same sort of thing straight in um, or you've got this extended standard center so from uh, smaller pieces the optional centers are these um, you've got a decreased taper again a really useful thing for, for punkier timbers You've now got an inverted cup center, okay, for holding round tip things. So if you if you've got a dibber or something like that, or a, a spurtle or anything like those things, and you want to just do a little bit of sanding, you can put it between centers um, and use that. That's like a soft center; it'll just support it. Um, but one of the better ones I found, I love this center. This is a, a mini faceplate. Okay, and I'm just going to very quickly do something with that for you just to demonstrate how useful that could be. Just a very, very small uh, little addition to the centers. I'm going to make a wooden a wooden uh, center to add to that collection. So let's start off with, let's start off just with a regular, regular little, little center in there. I'm going to use my Pro Drive. This is my 16 millimeter pro drive. So about 5.8 pro drive. Um, got the little teeth on the outside and a sprung pin on the center. So if I pop that there, and I've got a little bit of ash here, refer to as olive ash. Take that up. I'm gonna use a fairly small tool rest. Just going to rough it down just briefly and I'm going to get it mounted onto our face plate. Let's just trim that end up. I was just going to go in there with a skew. There we are. So what we've what we're doing is is making a little dome center. So what I can do now with that one, if we go with. The face, face plate over the top. I'm not worried at this stage about getting it dead centered or anything like that. Let's just screw it together. I've got 
only got big screws here, so fingers crossed that's going to fit in there nicely. Like I said, I'm, I'm really not worried that that this is centered just yet. There we go. One more. Two more. And then once I've made this little little gadget, I can keep this. This will be with me for life. There we are. I'm going to pop that in a jaw. And we may as well go with whatever jaw I've got here. Let's have a, let's have a look. What can I use? Let's say... We'll go with the small C jaw. There we are. I just want to do a little bit of turning on that that bung. Let's say you've got a goblet, fat. Just go to the overhead a second, um, Steph. What I'm going to do is show everybody um, what exactly what I'm talking about. Get that held in there. See, Jaws. So you've turned the inside of your goblet. You just want to refine the stem. Tommy bar. So to swap these centers out, all we're going to do is use the Tommy bar. Undo that collar. And that will then push the center out. There we are. Go back up again. And now my little dome center can go in there. And I've got a way of holding that goblet okay this has been this has had a little bit of uh, uh probably a few months a little bit of a wobbling but there's a way of supporting it. without damaging the inside i would probably add a little bit of um uh, soft tissue on the inside just to help you can see i haven't trued up the back end yet because it was held within the chuck but a little bit of work on that you can have several uh, mini face plates, make several domes for several different sizes. And it's a great way of supporting pieces um, that you're working on. So that's, uh, that's the uh, multi-head center and six um, different attachments available for that one. So again, like I say, it's, it's a nice little, little center to, to have several uses for. Yes, Steph. Um, we've got... Uh, question here. Um, I want to turn a three-point bowl, so I need a live centre with a hole in the middle. Does Accents to make those multi-tip live centres? So we have... Let me just take out my... Point. I'm going to show you this one next, actually. This is the... Um, uh, or what would we call this? this is the, the hollow live centre with exhaust. I was looking for that word, the exhaust. We've got three holes in there. Look. So this is what we're going to use for long hole boring. But by taking that center point out, you've got that hollow in the middle with the ring around the outside. So the point of your three point bowl, or your three uh, cornered bowl, can go in there as you're turning those other corners around. So absolutely yes is the answer to that one. Um, and uh, I'm going to pop that in there because we are going to use it. Not on a three sided bowl or three pointed bowl but we're going to use it just to do a little bit of long hole boring now we'll just take the corners off of that one we'll put a regular regular center so that can be a, a a larger pro drive or four prong drive 
two prong drive, jumbo drive, or six prong drive, um, you know, whichever you want to go for. So we've got four, we've got a jumbo, we've got a six prong, um, we got we also do a um, a two prong, or you've got the choice of your pro drive here, which serrations, remember, and a little sprung center. So many choices in terms of drives, and it does it does make a difference in terms of um, jumbo drives. That's for very big pieces. So let's say you're doing a porch newel post or staircase newel post, uh, porch pillars, pillars that sort of thing. You'd want to go bigger drive as you can before you go onto a faceplate for those. Um, but general turning, I tend to be going more pro drive. If the timber's a bit too soft, then I need something to sink in a bit deeper, so I go either six or four. Um, or if the timber has an unusual surface, so it's not square, then I'll go two prong. So there's there's many reasons for using different different centers. Steph, yes. So we've got a question here from one of our our woodworking wisdom regulars, Bob. Um, no he said, "What are the options when you need a long bore and your tailstock is solid?" Your tailstock is solid. solid, as in the center, Bob. I'm guessing you're meaning. Um, you don't really have a lot of choice, to be fair. Um, back in the day, I did see um, um, tails, uh, hollow lives to go into a tool post, um, but I haven't seen them for a long time. Really, you do need to get a hollow live center to do the job. Um, unless you mean, actually, you're probably talking about the tail stock itself being solid. Um, He's putting brackets one way after solid right i don't know I, i'm guessing that's the tail stock if it's the tail stock again i'm not sure I, there's nothing i know that comes through the headstock to <coughs> excuse me to um to be able to do that and even the record machines the record power ones they have a solid headstock but the hollows live for that very reason so you can do you can long hole ball with them um I would I would ask that question if you if, if it's on your one way lathe I would ask that question on the one way forums and see if anybody's come up with the the issue I reckon that that thing that I'm telling you about the one that goes into the the banjo of the Taurus I think that may be a one way solution um, but I'm not entirely sure on that everything I've always done throughout the thirty odd years of interning has always come from that tailstock Bob has put in and um, the wood Chinese has put in, he's got a one way lathe right. Right, so that must be yeah, must be a one way thing then in that case. I would I would go to them and I would ask or look on the forums and see what they say. I'm sure there is a solution. Not but I'm not familiar with the one way lathes as in the use of them. Um, so I can't really answer that one at this stage. I will research it, Bob. So ask me when you see me again on uh, on our other streams, our regular streams. All he right? said he said maybe he needs a new lathe. Well, I know where you can get one. <laughs> Four or six is pretty nice. <laughs> Four or six is really nice, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Right, let's just do a little bit of... I'm talking and talking and talking. Let's do a little bit more turning here. I'll just do a simple spindle. Let's pretend. Let's pretend we're going to do this one here. But what I'm going to do with this one, we're going to long hole ball through it. But I want to then create a mortise that you can then create a tenon to fit into let's say you're doing a standard lamp so you're joining two long pieces together in the middle um, which is something we we need to do so if i create the mortise i'll then put another piece of timber on and quickly do a tenon to fit it together um, and this is this is great i really really like this um, to work with um, i'll do uh, i'll just knock the corners off of this first um, Zoom out a little bit, do we? Right. Pop that camera on a minute and I'll zoom out for you, everybody. I've got to put some earplugs in. Check my old ears. Because after a while... One bit of caution that I'll give you. If you're new to turning, think about... Everybody thinks about their lungs. Everybody thinks about their eyes. No one really thinks about their ears when it comes to turning and they are as important as every other thing and if you don't protect them your ears are right in line especially in bowl turning with the, that loud speaker that's pointing your direction so make sure 
that you put some ear protection in. These are I just got foam uh, foam ear protectors in, but at home I tend to wear the full over ear ear protection, and then put my ear pods underneath, boom me music out, which really works. Right, we're rough down. We're not the corners off first. There we are. So, just down to a cylinder. We'll stop, check. We'll do a very, very rough shape. So, I'm literally maximum diameter. Look, it's still a little flat there. So, let's just do a very rough bit of turning and we'll then bore up through the center. So, what we need to do next, of course, once we've roughed down, is clean up. So, we'll get the skew. Just a little bit of cleaning up, planing across the top surface. And if we're going to repeat that one, uh, let's go. Just around over quickly. I'm really speeding through this and, and uh, not concentrating too much on shape. Let's go down a little bit smaller on the ends. And I don't want to finish this end yet because we still need the drive centers doing their stuff. So let's go um, to a smaller gouge. We'll just get a little bit of shape, but leave a, a little bit on the ends ready to, to reshape when we finish. Like I say, we're just going to knock a, a basic shape out. And clean that up very quickly. Let's bore through that one. So I'll put the tools back. So what I need to do now, we've done the main shape. What the tailstock has already done for us is give us a little, a little ring in the center. Now you're not going to pick this up on camera. I'm positive. If I even if I get the glare off. There is, but around the center dot, there's a little ring. Now, what I need to do now is just remove the center point. Because we don't want that center point in there anymore. Don't lose any of the shavings. And we're just now going to use the ring. So 
sorry, just for two seconds. Steph, I'm going to put that light on. My old eyes can't really make that out. There we are. That's found our centre. There we are. So nice and tight. And what I want you to watch now is these holes. So as they spin, the shavings are going to come out of those holes, those little exhaust holes. Um, I'm going to use the, the long hole boring auger. And that's going to be fitted within that uh, the long hole boring handle. So the handle is on a little cam. So if I undo that, I can slide that up and down. So I could, if I wanted to, it's a big old... Um, in fact, go back to the main camera a minute. It's the, um, so if I get that right the way back into the cam, you can go up one whole length and then you can double that on to your other piece. So when you're fitting together um, a standard lamp, you've got double sections. So one length of that and another length of that. So you can get a fairly, a fairly big um, standard lamp done. You've got to think about where you're going. All I need to do on this piece is go through... Just past halfway, that'll be fine. Start the machine. Um, you may find sometimes you get a little bit of screeching on this. If you do a little bit of your regular wood wax, we'll sort that out. But nice and gentle, watch the shavings. Before, what we've usually had to do is sort of keep taking that uh, that auger out every five seconds and declogging it. But those sh those um, those holes in the side really really help. See all those shavings coming out of there. Perfect. There, that's one side. We've actually, if you look at the where that went to, that's gone way past the halfway point. Okay, what you do now. is we're going to swap that over, turn it around. This time, we're going to take that sensor out and use the drive sensor. The drive sensor, though, has a pin in it, same size as the auger that we've just used. Again, if, all right, so present that to the camera. You can see that auger, but it's a regular drive sensor with that, that pin on it. So now all I need to do to help me drive. And I'll just slot that in. Center back up. Take the pin back out. Sort of getting the idea now. Now we'll just keep going through until we hit the other hole. There we are, I'm through already. So we're all the way through. So that's got a hole running right up the middle now. I'll take it off its drive. I don't know whether we're going to get this on camera. <laughs> I'm going to have to aim through the middle. Turn that right off. There he is. You get the idea, you know. There it is. Look, hole all the way through the middle. 
Um, so even now before in the past, I used to have all sorts of trouble with the August coming out the side and, and things like that. But that seemed to centers it out really, really nicely. And so even on your longer pieces, you'll be able to get that whole central all the way. But if you wanted to join something, it's really important to get an accurate mortise and tenon. So what we can do with this piece now, we're going to carry on and um, drive in the in the lathe. But I'm going to have the timber stationery, and we're going to add and just change this four prong drive on here um, to a cutter head. So instead of having a four prong drive, we're up above there in a minute. So we're going to put this cutter on there. Okay, again, so that's going to give us a lovely mortise, which you can then afterwards go on and shape a tenon to fit on your other piece. So let's get the right Allen key or undo that. Undo there, slide that one off, put the new one back on. in position now if you're going to try and do this with a square piece have your tool rest up against the edge so that the piece can't uh, turn on a round piece and i'm going to do i'm going to do that side actually um i'm going i can hold it it's fine but if you square piece then just do do make sure that you're uh, you've got it supported um you don't have to use a um, a rotating tail sock center in the tail sock this time because you don't want it rotating. Um, I am, but you don't have to. Um, get the tool rest right out of the way. Lay it on. I'm just going to push. Turn the lay speed down a wee bit. About 1200. Then back. Sometimes you're going to get quite a lot of screeching on that back. It's only friction, but a little bit of wood wax, like I said, really works. So bring that away. And that's set again. The center pin. The center pin is guiding um, the hole in line with your center ball. So you can see now to join. All you've got to do on your second piece is create a tenon that's going to fit in there, um, and you can have a bead to disguise it or whatever. But um, really, really quick way of joining timber. You could have multiples if you wanted to have different color timbers, for instance, running up your, your um, standard lamp. All right. So there. Um, I think we've run out of time, everybody. Have we got any more questions before we say? Yeah, we've got one that's just come in. Um, he said, asking, hi, Colwyn, what do you recommend for beginning bowl turning? For beginning bowl turning, in terms of lathe, in terms of tools, and it's this, that's the thing, isn't it? When you start your wood turning journey, there's so much to consider. I would start off, if you're unsure, I would start off um, with a bench top machine um, with small pieces. So if you're going to have a bench top machine, a wood turning set is important because I'll tell you why. It's not um, for any other reason apart from the fact that wood turning sets generally have shorter handles. And the one main reason for that is so they can fit into a box. Um, with short handles, it means you don't, as you come around the bowl, you're not hitting the bed of the lathe, which is a common problem with bench top machines with the long tools that we've got back here you see bench uh, or bowl, bowl sets are much shorter again it's another set much shorter that's the same make as uh this one here look at the difference because that's from a set okay so go for a, a bench top lathe a set um go for i would probably go 100 mil chuck and one basic set of jaws okay so if you can get yourself a starter kit faceplate ring screw chuck once you've practice with that then you're developing your own uh, likes in terms of wood turning you may go a direction that will say okay i need that set of jaws actually i do need a bigger lathe etc etc so i would start really quite basic get loads of practice in start with spindle work before you go into bow work um, get some of those tool skills developed um, keep the lathe um moderately not slow slow but keep it don't go don't go too fast too soon um there's a very um it's very easy to uh, 
um, compromise your work holding on the lathe if you go too fast. Difficult to do that if you go too slow, you just get a poor finish um, and a little bit more um, pressure on the tools. So yeah, that, watch demonstrations, um, go to seminars, um, talk to lots of people, join a club, all of that sort of thing if you're just beginning. All right. I think that's everything. Um, just everybody saying how great the demo was. So thank you very much, Carl. Well, thank you. There's loads more that I I wanted to get to that I haven't got to to, uh, to you today, but this is not the last time. Um, if you remember last the the one we did before, where you were doing jewellery, and we're just going to keep this going. We're going to keep looking at different things you can do with the chucks, the jaws, and the centres, um, and we may have a few fresh faces as well in the next. Um, next few uh, months coming so thank you thanks steve as well for hosting this and um and for, for doing so well over there in the us i'll see you soon like i can say if you're at the aw go bop and say hello to to jason uh, breach or helen bailey uh, they're there um and uh, they'll be showing and using off our chucks as well so thanks very much everybody and goodbye <laughs>